There we go. Doing good. Uh, so thank you guys so much for being here at First Baptist Church Holland uh, this week. Uh, we are so glad that all of you are here today. Uh, thanks to those that are watching on Facebook, online. Um, and so just real quick, wanted to give a quick update about how camp went last week. Uh, so we took eight students. Um, and thanks to your generosity, we were able to take those students. And uh, we had seven uh, make decisions. And so we had five recommitments of life and two commitments of life uh, to Jesus, and so we are so excited for that. Thank you guys, there we go, yeah, right? They're part of our family now, and so we are so excited. Uh, thank you guys to those that supported, um, and yeah, that's all I got. Uh, that's all you need to know this week, so let's stand in worship. from Colossians this morning, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord's word says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Would everybody bow your heads for prayer? Father God, we come to you this morning to ask for your blessing. Blessing be upon this worship service that we would be genuine and authentic in worshiping you because you deserve that. Uh, you are the creator of the universe and we are thankful that um, you love us enough to watch over us, to protect us, that you gave us your son who died for us so that we would have hope uh, even in these sometimes dismal days. So, Father God, please bless this service. Bless the people for giving the service. Bless Dr. Frank as he sends us our message. And bless all the people here as we give thanks to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You stand and let's worship with us. It's so good to hear those reports from camp the last couple of weeks. Appreciate Melinda and Thomas, uh, their willingness to take our children away, right? It's amazing what God can do as we lift his name on high. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall to bring forth the Join me and the last 
Lord a hand in that. That's what we're here to do. We're here to raise up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's power in that beautiful name of the Lord. You were the word of the beginning. One with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in It will last the test of time. It will be forever. As the psalmist said in Psalm 136, over and over and over and over again. The steadfast love of the Lord endureth how long? 
forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God of peace. The Lord endures forever. Oh, he is good, he is above all things. The Lord endures forever. Sing praise. seated for just a moment as Linda Roberts comes up. As Linda's going to come up and uh, lead us into our time of offering. We will continue to worship at the conclusion of her prayer. And those of you that are here and have an offering to give to the Lord, we encourage you to bring it to the offering stands here either in the front or at the back of the church. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving. It's the summer months and I know it's kind of tough and a lot of people in and out. Uh, but our ministry occurs because of your faithfulness, Miss Linda. How good is it to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 Let us bow and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today just thanking you for being our Heavenly Father. Thanking you that you sent your Son to come to this earth to die for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to come today. It is our privilege to give to you. Help each one of us to give all that we can to further your kingdom of God, because that's what it's all about. When it's all said and done, you're all that matters in this whole, whole world. Forgive us when we fail you. Forgive us when we don't do what we should do. All these things we ask in your most holy and precious and powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's continue to worship. Stand through singing. Worship through singing. Worship through giving. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. The moment that I wake up, till I lay my head, oh, I will sing. Faithful. 
can happen so, so good. Every breath that I ever made, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice, you have led me through the fire. for your goodness and I thank you for the privilege as has already been mentioned to be in your house to sing praise because song and music has always accompanied your presence and I'm so grateful that we can join with the angels in praising your name in Jesus name and all God's people say amen and amen thank you you can be seated about y'all but here's one thing I do know I am really excited as I move this mic out of the way by the way our pulpit microphone has having some wiring issues so we're looking at getting that worked on which is why the pulpit is not here uh, however I have been really excited about beginning this summer series called the fingerprints of God and why would I label something like that or title something the fingerprints of God? Because what is it about a fingerprint? What does a fingerprint do for you or for me? If somebody asks for your fingerprint, what is that a good thing that it happens? Uh, what's the result of that? It identifies you, right? All right, so people can identify you by your fingerprint. And we're going to be looking at some of the things that God is identified for uh, about and one of those, some of those are the attributes of God, and other things are His names. And so it's a summer series in which one week will be totally, entirely uh, not next, not tied to the next week. So if you're in and out, as we all are so often during the summer months, you won't be missing something if you just show up. If you can only be here uh, every other week or something like that, it's not like you will have missed something from the week before that you're, it's necessary to build uh, like an expository study through a book, for example. You might miss a chapter or so or half a chapter. Uh, each week will be a standalone message. And so I'm excited about that. Now, in the meantime, we got a, a card in the mail just the other day, and I'll read part of it to you. Some of you may remember months ago, uh, Matthew and Erica, which came actually probably January, February on, on the month, actually that came in December, uh, the month that we were talking about Lottie Moon Christmas offering and how that helps our foreign missionaries. 
And so that was the week that I had chosen to highlight Lottie Moon, and y'all were faithful with your giving for Lottie Moon. Thank you so much for that. Well, there was a young couple here in the service uh, that I had never seen before, and so immediately after the service, I went and visited with them. Well, sure enough, uh, they were missionaries, foreign missionaries, with our International Mission Board, the Southern Baptist Convention, waiting their assignment, and because of COVID, they were put on ice, so to speak. They were put on hold for quite some time. Then both of them ended up getting COVID. Their parents that they were staying with in Temple got COVID, so it got put off more and more and more. And about two months ago, they were able to start the process of going overseas, COVID and all. And so they went through the proper uh, things, steps that were necessary for that, and they ended up in Germany, which is their training ground. That's not their ultimate final destination for their mission work. I want to read you just a couple of things that they put on the card. First off, I thank you so much for being a part of praying us here because we did. I was able to visit with them several times over breakfast and lunch and many, many phone conversations. We tried three different times to get them to come give testimony before they left, and every one of those times it fell through on their part, be again, because of the COVID. I really wanted you all to hear from people that we uh, collect gifts and offerings for to help them spread the gospel around the world. So we prayed much much, much together, uh, the three of us did. So he said, we are also grateful to have been allowed to come where they are now at this time. And God has already opened up doors for the message and to invest in new believers. By God's grace, we've settled into our new place. We have warm and welcoming neighbors. We await our approved visas, hopefully sometime this month early next month. You and First Baptist Holland are certainly in our prayers. Please feel free to email us with any special prayer requests that we might have. And that's the kind of uh, prayer relationship that we built. They were praying for things that, that we needed prayer for, and I was praying for things that they needed prayer for. And he just closed it with, we are grateful for you, uh, with respect, Matthew and Erica. So continue to remember Matthew and Erica and Barbara, it would be a good idea in our next journey in prayer to include the two of them. And at this point in time, we really won't say a whole lot about their location because as many of you know, so many of our missionaries serve in places that we really can't talk about uh, publicly because there are a lot of places around our world. And I know you can believe that. I know you've seen uh, some of the news stories that Christians are still being persecuted. And it's happening. It's, and some of us would say, well, it's happening right here in America. Yes, it is. But there's been very few of us that have had to shed our own blood for the cause of Christ or to surrender our lives for the cause of Christ. I just recently read about someone uh, actually in the, in the Boxer Rebellion of China several hundred years ago, and it was based on a spiritual thing and, and uh, suppression of the gospel. And uh, they had a group of students group of students that were in a Christian school and um, the people coming out there had a firing line set up and uh, this is the Boxer Rebellion you read about some of this in, in history books and that sort of thing and so as they got to the door of this school uh, they put a cross they took a cross and laid it on the ground this is the people that were against Jesus and they told the group in the school about a hundred people hundred kids uh, middle school and high school age said, if you will step on the cross as you walk out, you can live. Step on it. In other words, disrespect it. If you come out of the door and walk around the cross, you will be shot. And the first nine students that came out of that door stopped at the cross and stepped on it. And they walked away uh, unharmed. And the tenth young lady that came out, a little teenage girl, stopped at the head of that cross, knelt down and prayed out loud and said, God, give me the strength and the courage to do what I need to do. And she stood up and walked around the cross and was immediately shot. And the other 89 that followed her did the same. It's still happening. Yes, that was the Boxer Rebellion history. It's still happening today. We need to pray for the missionaries.
that we help support with your hard-earned money, your hard-earned gifts, your tithes, your gifts above your tithe, like Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong, Mary Hill Davis, we need to continue to pray for those folks because they are spreading the gospel in places that where people don't want them to. They just don't want them to. They let them know that uh, very, very clearly and very plainly. So a couple other things I want to ask you about this morning before we dump, jump, jump right in, dive in. That was kind of somewhere I started to say dump and jive, but those don't go together, right? So it came, yeah. So where you jump right in, dive right into God's fingerprint. A couple of questions I have for you. What are some of the games that you played? Some of you adults that are in the room, what are some of the games that you played as a child outside? Uh, just, you know, whether it was twilight or in the morning or whenever you got together with your neighborhood friends or your family, what are some of the outside games you played? Now, I'm not talking about baseball and football and volleyball and that kind of stuff. Just games you played just to try and have something to do to take up some time. What were some of them? Hide and seek. That would probably be, would y'all say, how many people in here have played hide and seek? Raise your hand. That's just about most everybody. All right, give me another one. Wait, I heard several. What are they? Red Rover. How many played Red Rover? Red Rover, Red Rover. Uh, sin. Who's it's right over, right? And then you got to hold the line, right? You can't, you can't bust that line. What's another one that you play? Dodgeball. There you go. Uh, they made a movie about that not too long ago. Yeah. Uh, we didn't play with softball, so did we? Uh, no, like, I mean, not softball, like baseball, softball. We didn't play with balls that were soft. You know, that we played hardball, right? That was good. All right, something else. What was that? Hide and seek, we did that. Anybody play red light, green light? Yeah. All right, some of you played red light, green light. And what's, what's the purpose of that? You got to, when the green light goes, right? How many of you have ever gone in life through a red light? And you're not supposed to. Notice my hand is up. Yeah, pastor's guilty. It's confession time. Y'all just want to confess your, your problems with red lights and green lights in today's world? I don't think so. But hide and seek is probably the number one that people are still playing today. And another one that I absolutely love, and I don't, this one may be new to some of y'all, sardines. Who's played sardines? Three people in this whole congregation. We may have to have a sardines game, one fellowship. But sardines is a little different. You got to hide. It's a little bit like hide and seek. But you hide in places, and if you're found, then you are part of the seeking part. And the weird part about sardines is you try and find the smallest places to hide in, and you hide together, and you get like in a little can of sardines, all right? And so it's uh, crazy. I've had people uh, get behind Coke machines like this, behind the, and all the electrical cords. I've had them get in the... Uh, uh, I'm not even sure exactly what to call this, Rex, the return air unit on the inside of a building in the closet, and you jump in that return, is that what that's called, the return air kind of inside one of those closets and wires going everywhere? I'm going, no, don't get in there. Uh, but it's just crazy. But hide and seek, sardines, there's a purpose for that. And what is the main purpose of hide and seek? To not be found. And at certain point in time in the game, and there's a couple of people still out that haven't been found. There's kind of a time limit that comes. Because we kind of set our own time limit because we want to change who's it, right? We, we don't want the same person to be it all the time. And so at that time limit, then there's a call that goes out. What is that call? Ollie, ollie income, what? Come free. Okay, so you're coming to the home base. You're coming home. And in essence, you get a free pass to come home. And you're thinking to yourself probably right now, what in the world do children's games have to do with the fingerprints, the attributes of God? Well, our purpose of the Scripture passage 
that Jennifer just read just a few moments ago. If you could take the last eight words of that, which I'll get to in just a minute. If you could take the last eight words and then figure out there's a reason that you and I need to hide even today. And that reason can be found in John chapter 3, verse 30. When he must increase, he must get bigger, and we must decrease. So the smaller we get as we hide ourselves in Christ, the better it is for us, kind of like the sardines game. We need to get real small for what you and I think is important in life. And we need to magnify who Jesus is. Because the last eight words in Colossians 3.3, 3, your life is hidden with Christ in God. There could be 150, there could probably be 500, there could be 10,000 sermons preached on those eight words. Your life, my life, is hidden with Christ in God. And today's attribute that we're looking at is God's infinitude. Infinitude. In other words, how long, how wide does God go on and on? And how much of his love? Exactly what is forever. Uh, somebody asked me one day, uh, how long is forever? I said, well, you get to eternity and add a day. And every time that day comes, you add another day, and you add another day, and it just goes on and on and on. And that is the infinitude of God, and I'm telling you, that is not something that I understand, and I'm preaching about it. I, I, have, no, I, I have no real concept of how to explain God's infinitude to you in such a manner that I can understand it. All I can do is give you some scripture passages and some thoughts on what it means to be forever with God but I haven't lived it. You haven't experienced it. I haven't. It's going to be something that's very difficult for us to really, truly, and honestly grasp. So what we're going to do is take a journey to infinity today. A journey to infinity. It's not as though some of us perhaps watched uh, the Marvel comic book DC series movies that said talked about the Infinity Wars. How many of those? We got some of those watched Infinity Wars. Uh, yeah, I see those young hands going up. And Travis, you too. Yeah, I saw, I saw that hand. Uh, Travis, my, my hand's up too. All right, I'm, I'm, book me, Dano. I'm guilty as charged. Yes, it's not, it's not the Infinity Wars. It's not somebody coming to take over the universe and have power over infinity because there's no person that can do that. There's only one infinite being. Yet... Yeah. There's three. And that's part of our understanding must be about the infinitude of God. We must understand who God is in relationship to the Son and the Holy Spirit. So as I was studying and preparing for this, I've got tons of books and, and uh, commentaries, but the book I lean on most heavily and have for years uh, is a book by A.W. Tozer, and I know I've quoted him before, and many of you read uh, about A.W. Tozer. He's got a book called The Attributes of God that is totally, like, mind-blowing, um, really mind-blowing. It doesn't get into the names of God, so this is just one of the, of the uh, items that I will use in study and preparation, even when I'm not preaching on the attributes of God. Uh, I read a whole lot of Tozer because he's just that way. Well, in Tozer's Attributes of God book, he refers to a lady by the name of Lady Julian, who 600 years ago wrote a book, and Tozer quotes her in his attributes, and here's one of the quotes of Lady Julian. Suddenly, the Trinity filled my heart with joy, and I understand that so it shall be in heaven without end. This eternity that we're talking about, heaven without end, She's seeing heaven in this quote of hers in this book that she wrote 600 years ago, and suddenly the Trinity filled her heart with joy, and as she, when she and you and I get to heaven, it's going to be that way forever. So here's what she's trying to describe 
not just heaven. It's not, it's not the heaven we think about. When you and I think about heaven, we sometimes think about, well, the asphalt that we're going to walk on is actually pure gold. And we think about, oh, I can't wait to see, uh, to get to heaven because I'll be able to, man, I'll be able to see my, my loved ones that have gone on before me. I will be able to uh, visit with other people in, uh, in my history that are in heaven and get to renew our acquaintances. Uh, and I'm often asked, Frank, will we, will we know each other when we get to heaven? This is not a series on heaven, uh, but yes, we will. The scripture details that uh, very plainly, even, even that some that are not in heaven can see what's going on in heaven. Oh, if you'll just tell, the rich man said to Lazarus, oh, just a drop of water on my tongue to soothe the fire. And if you can't do that, will you at least go to earth and warn my family about what's impending? And the answer was, they've already heard the prophets. They haven't listened then. They're not going to listen now. Yes, we will know our loved ones in heaven. And it reminds me of the song written by Michael English and made famous not just by Michael English, but the Gaither Vocal Band. Any Gaither Vocal Band people out there? There's a few of y'all out there. We love the Gaither Vocal Band, and, and often I've played a clip from Mark Lowry, who is a comedian but was a part of the uh, uh, vocals of the Gaither Vocal Band. Incredible, incredible time. I'm going to read part of this, one of their most popular songs entitled, I Bowed on My Knees. I dreamed of a city called Glory. So bright and so fair, when I entered the gates, I cried holy, because the angels, well, they all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion, and oh, the sights that I saw. But I said, I want to see Jesus, because he's the one who died for all. I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. I clapped my hands and sang, glory, glory to the Son of God. I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, 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 glory to the Son of God. And then the next verse says this, as I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones, oh, they all knew me well. And I don't base what I just said on a song. I base it on the Word of God. But this song is based on the Word of God. My loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the streets of heaven. Such scenes were too many to tell. And, and this author, Michael, says, I saw Abraham and Jacob. And Isaac, and I think about, as I stray from the song for a moment and chase a rabbit, and some of y'all say, shoot him pretty quick, right? Because yeah, we want to hear the rest of that song in our minds. And I know some of you are singing it right now. But as I think about that, I think about the times I've thought, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go see Paul. I'm going to say, Paul, I don't understand this part about this, the Romans, and this part about it. And can you explain, Moses, Moses, what did you actually see when that bush was burning? And yet it wasn't, Joshua, what was it like? facing the Jordan River at flood stage and then walking across and the scripture says on dry ground when he split the waters not muddy ground Josh what was that like I think about that and then I think about yes visiting with those loved ones that have gone on before me but here's Here's what Michael English said. Such scenes were too many to tell. I saw Abraham, Jake, Jacob, and Isaac. I talked with Mark and Timothy, but I said, I want to see Jesus. All these other people are good. I'm going to enjoy, going to enjoy the reunion. But I want to see Jesus because he's the one that died for me. And Lady Julian, 600 years ago, saw that heaven will be heaven because the Trinity will fill our hearts with joy without end. Joy without end. You see, the Trinity is our maker. The Trinity is our keeper. The Trinity is our everlasting love that we sang about just a few moments ago. The Trinity is our forever joy that we will have. I want to turn your attention the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And as we look at Isaiah, 
chapter 40, here's what I want us to, to look at very briefly. Very briefly, as we look at Isaiah chapter 40, it's a, it's a common, common passage. We've even had a lot of songs about that, but here's what I see. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Let's start with verse 27. The prophet says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden, hide and seek, and my way is now hidden from God. And Isaiah is saying to the people of Israel, why do you say that? Why do you say your way is hidden and your right, your rights are disregarded by God? And oh, that's what we want to talk about often, isn't it? In today's culture, is I have a right. I, I have a right to fill in the blank, whatever your right is. Well, I, I, have, a, I have an opinion. Yes, you do. And your opinion in two and a half dollars will buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, right? Unless you like the really good stuff, and then it's five or six. I have a right. And the prophet asked the people of Israel, God's people, why do you say your right is disregarded? Verse 28, have you not known and have you not heard? It's the Lord that is the everlasting God, the creator of all the ends of the earth. He does not faint, he does not grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. It's never ending. God's understanding of who he is in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, in our lives, no one, none of us, I don't care how long you go to seminary, six years is plenty enough time for me, I'm done. I'm done. You can't understand it. It's unsearchable. You can't study enough to figure it out. That's why infinitude, as one of God's attributes, that's the first one I wanted to tackle, because quite honestly, this is the hardest one really to understand fully. I want to, but I just won't be able to. So why does the Trinity tie with Infinitude. Turn to John. We're going to be doing a lot of turning in your Bibles, so get ready to do that. Turn John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Some of y'all are turning pages. I'll give you a second. John 1, 1 through 5, it may be on the screen. Yes, I think it is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, he was in the beginning with God. Genesis chapter 1, we look turn right back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 the very first verse in the word of God in the beginning same thing like John 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth but in the beginning the word was with God and the word was God and the word is capitalized so who is the word referring to Jesus Christ was in the beginning at creation and how do we also know that because Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 when God's creating everything that he's creating he's creating the heavens he's creating the earth he's creating the expanse of the sea he's creating all this stuff the animals and then all of a sudden he gets to say I want to create man but he didn't say I he said let us make man in my image oh no he didn't say that let us make man in our image. And if we want to understand infinitude of God as his attribute, we must understand that there's more than just God at stake here. There's more than just God as a principal player. There is this trinity that Lady Julian refers to. It's this trinity in the forever of heaven that's going to fill our hearts with joy unending. And I don't think we're going to have the same curiosity that we have here on earth where we want to know the answers to everything. I think it's going to be like Michael Inglis. I want to see Jesus. Because all these other people 
Oh, they did some good things for me, but nobody, nobody died so I could be here and singing with a hundred million angels. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And that's what heaven's going to be like. And some of y'all are thinking, well, you know, some of these new modern praise songs, y'all repeat the chorus 15 times. You ever sung six songs of a hymn, six verses of a hymn with a chorus? You did the same thing. It's just different. It's what we get used to. You get to heaven, there's going to be some repetition, y'all. How much repetition? Forever. We will be singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. We won't need to sing testimonial songs about who I used to be and who I now am because that used to be is in time. That is in our time, and God does not work within time. God is outside of time, and when we get to heaven, we will likewise be outside of time. We will be in this part of our eternal life that Jesus saved us to, that you may never perish, John 3.16 says. We're in that part, the physical life right now, but there will be a time when God brings us home. Wasn't totally free, though. Cost him his son. But when God brings us home, we'll be outside of what we know is time. Because the Bible says, that's not my opinion, the Bible says a day with the Lord is just a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. That's not my opinion. That's what the Scripture says. So we'll be outside of that, in that eternal state of our existence. Where we are right now, still in an eternal state of an existence, it's an eternal state of physical existence, which is temporary. And then God will bring us home at the right time. So what did Jesus say in John chapter 14? Oh, he said, here's, here's what I want you all to realize. He said, here's, here's the way this is going to roll. John chapter 14, he's talking to his disciples, and, and uh, he's trying to prepare them for what is to come. And Jesus uh, even foretold of Peter's denial. He talked about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's so much of chapter 14 uh, we hear at funerals from time to time. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. So, you know, this mansion that we talk about and sing about. And Thomas didn't understand. And Philip, in verse 8, said, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. He's talking to Je Jesus. Show us, God, the Father. This Jehovah Elohim that, that we know about from the God of our fathers, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, that we've read about in the five books of the law. We want to see that guy. We want to see that God. Jesus, show us the Father, and it'll be enough. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen me. The Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And I think often we relegate God to some being that he's not. You know, I think uh, when I was teaching science years ago, people would, in a public school, I would infiltrate, yes, uh, in, in a in a good way when students ask me questions to try and explain spiritual beliefs and my religious convictions, and I would use uh, HOH, hydrogen hydroxide, H2O we often refer to it, uh, but because of chemical bonding, it's hydrogen attaches to oxygen and vice versa. Um, so I would say, okay, yeah, you have water that can be liquid, and you have water it can be vapor. Oh, yeah, we've seen that like with fog and stuff or, or steam coming out of the kettle. Oh, yeah. And then you have, what's the other form? Well, it's ice. I said, what, what is each one of them? Each one of them is water. Each one of them is hydrogen hydroxide in three different forms. And if you see one, you've really seen them all. And that's a very poor illustration of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm telling you, it's not adequate. But it was just one that I thought perhaps a teenager could wrap their minds around. And perhaps some of you and I need to wrap our minds about the simplistic yet complicated nature of the Trinity. We can't understand that either. We just know when we've seen one, 
We've seen them all. Not my opinion. That's Jesus. Well, what do you mean? You didn't talk about the Spirit. Well, well turn in your Bible with me to 1 John then. All right, I'm trying to answer y'all's questions that you had not asked yet. Is that all right? That's, oh, that's what happens. There goes my notes. It's all right. Uh, 1 John chapter 4. The Scripture says in verse 10, This is love, not that we love God, but He loved us, sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. There's a big word for you. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. <laughs> if we love one another, God abides in us. He doesn't hide himself in us. God lives in us. And the love that God is, is perfected, the scripture says, in us. And by this we know that we abide in him. Your life hidden with Christ in God. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He's given us His Spirit. And we've seen, we've seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, then God abides in Him and He in God. So now we come to know and believe the love of God, the love that God has for us. And catch this, God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And this commandment, verse 21, we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. You see, our life is to be hidden in Christ because the love of God abides in us because God the Spirit, through the Spirit, abides in us. And so when we get shook up, it's a little bit like a Coke can or a Coke bottle, if we get shook up, what is going to come out of us? It's whatever is inside of us. And if when you get shook up and somebody takes the can opener, the, the bottle opener, and pops the top, and something spews out that's not of God, there's a problem. Because our life is supposed to be hidden with Christ in God because of the Spirit that God sent after Jesus said, greater works will you do than I have done because I'm going to go be with my Father. But we're going to send the Spirit, the paraclete, the helper, the helper. And with the helper, you will do greater works than I do because I'm going to be seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. We have the Spirit of God in us. And it's that infinitude of God that allows us to know the love of God here on earth and in heaven. We don't have to wait to get there because our life is to be hidden. It's not, Paul didn't tell the church at Colossae, say, hey, it'd be a good idea for you to hide your life in Christ. You know, that, that'd work for most of you. Yeah, why don't we just, hey, hey, if you can. No, it was a statement that's a matter of fact. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And that is forever. Because forever God is faithful. And if God is in you through the sacrifice of his son Jesus on the cross, and Jesus conquering death, coming out of that grave, dying for your sin and mine, and he's seated at the right hand, and he sent his spirit with us who lives in us, forever than when you and I get shook up. By golly, if something comes out of you that is not of God, if something comes out of me that is not of God, that means for that moment in time, I am walking outside the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is not being manifested in my spirit. And that's an issue. That's an issue. You see, we sometimes think that we hear these great reports from camp got a text message this morning. I should read it to you. One of my, one of my uh, young men that I started mentoring when he was in first grade 
when I paddled him at school. <laughs> yeah, I did. I had a witness. Don't judge me. I can see some of y'all judging me right now. He deserved it, and he knows it. But he came up through my ministry as I went into full-time ministry, and now he's a pastor of a church. Here's what he said. He saw the reports from preteen camp last week. Melinda and those of you that went, praise the Lord for the salvation strength. God has continued this work as well. Carrying from last week and now this week with Vacation Bible School, God is on the move. Let his glorious light shine forth this morning as his word is proclaimed and his praise is lifted. We often think that all of our praises that we have concerning camps, they're just about camps and they don't really include us. They're just our little kids. They're just our teenagers. That's just, we, get, we send them to camp, gives us a few days away from them, and, and we're happy about that, and, and we're chilled. But, but the kids get away, and why does God speak? Because they're out of their normal environment. And I want you to know that God speaks outside that normal environment in a very specific way. But there is no reason, because God is infinitude. That is one of his attributes. There's no reason why he can't speak to you and to me in our normal environment, because he's God. But we sometimes don't live our lives like our life is hidden with Christ in God. And we say, no, you want that closet in my soul, Jesus? No, no. You can have most every part of my life, but oh, don't open the door to that closet, God. I, I, don't, I don't want you to see what's in there. You got something else hidden. And it's not Christ. And if you want an experience with Jesus, like you just heard Thomas talk about, and like we talked about last week with 60 preteen children enlarging the kingdom of heaven, which belongs to them anyway, because God said that. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. That's what God said. That's what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. It's here on earth. And why aren't we seeing revival in our churches? Why aren't we seeing movements of joy? In our churches, we haven't allowed the Spirit of God in His infinitude to infiltrate our life so that our life is hidden with Christ. We still want our way. It's my church. No, it's not. Never has been. You didn't die for it. It's only one church. One Lord. One baptism, one faith. And I didn't have anything to do with that except accept and believe and confess A, B, C's of salvation. That's all you can do. And if you're not happy with what spews out of you right now, it's only one medicine that you can take that will help you. And that's dive into this right here. That's all. That's all you need. You don't need so many of the other things that we think we do. So, 1 John chapter 4 talks about the Father and the Spirit, the Father and the Son. And if you want to experience the Trinity, you got to want to see Jesus. you got, you got to want that. you got to want that more than you want anything else in life. You have to want Jesus to be hidden in you in such a manner, your life to be hidden with him, so that when things don't go right, and they won't all the time in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. Has the world overcome you? Then let Jesus rule and reign in your heart because he's already overcome the world. You just got to let him. And quit being tied up with your own desires and your opinions and, and your desire to control and have power because you don't have it on your journey to infinitude god's going to bring many spiritual experiences salvation is not a one and done thing and the scripture says that as well daily daily i die to myself daily i pick up my cross why because daily i need to seek my salvation 
That doesn't mean that you're not once saved once and you can lose your salvation. No, it just means you live for Jesus day in and day out. And every day you renew your faith and your commitment. You know, Kevin and I were watching a little movie last night. And it was about a marriage ceremony and, and, the, uh, and the, the people at the end when they're doing their little things. And one of the ladies said, uh, and every day, every day of my marriage, I will renew my love and my commitment for you. Every day of their marriage. And this is what you and I need to do for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every day, God, I renew my love for you. Every day I renew the fact that my life is hidden with you, Jesus in God, and it's right here because you sent your spirit. You sent your spirit forever. You see, life is temporary, and God's infinitude is not something we can understand. So we use some words from time to time. We talk about uh, Chatty Cathy. What's Chatty Cathy do? Is that anybody's name in here? Chatty Cathy? I hope not. Uh, I worked on staff with one before, and uh, we laughed and joked about it all the time. Uh, but an unending chatterbox, basically, is who Chatty Cathy is, but she's not unending. She's not unending. No matter how much you think someone talks all the time, they don't. We think about uh, going to a restaurant, all you can eat. No, it's not. It's really not all you can eat. Well, it's all I can eat. No, it's not all. Because all is all. And all is everything they got. And beyond that, because God is the provider of all our sustenance and our food. It's not all you can eat. It's a little bit about what your stomach can hold. It's not all. It's a misnomer. It's a misrepresentation. But it brings in customers, doesn't it? Especially when it's catfish and shrimp. Boundless, unlimited minutes if you sign up with this cell phone plan. Unlimited. No, it's not. 50 years from now? 100 years from now? You still going to have that phone? 100 years from now, I'll probably be in heaven. You won't need one then, will you? What about 25 years from now? You think your plan will change? It's not unlimited. You see, there's only one boundless. There's only one unlimited. There's only one all. And that's God. Colossians chapter 3, same chapter, verses 10 and 11 says, We should put on the new self, which is being renewed, present tense, being renewed in knowledge, because knowledge is power. And if our new self that we're putting on is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator who created us in his, their own image, our image, let us create them in our image and knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek, there is no Jew, there's no circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, and those were the people that cut people's heads off, dug out the skulls, and drank the blood out of the skull. That's what was in the church at Colossae that people were having a trouble with because these are, these, are bar- these are like, these are bad people. But they accepted Jesus and they're new. And they're being renewed daily in the image of their creators. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There is free. There is no Scythian. There is no slave. There is no free. But Christ is. Christ is all. Christ is all. And he is in all. It's God alone. You know, we can measure most anything. This is going to be cool. Y'all, this is going to be good. A water. Men have measured water in the oceans. No way, Frank. I, yeah, way. You Google it. Not now. Wait till after the sermon. Water in oceans is supposedly 321 million cubic miles of water. I, I don't really understand that. Uh, Honestly, I don't want to. So we're just going to move on to the next point, all right? They have measured the grains of sand. Oh, nobody can measure the grains of sand. No scientist anywhere can measure the grains of sand in the Sahara Desert and on the ocean beaches. Oh, they think they have. And the crazy way they think they did it is they took a teaspoon. 
And they counted the grains of sand in a teaspoon and determined the average size of those grains of sand and then determined however much mileage there is of beaches and deserts. And what they came up with is seven quintillion, 500 quadrillion. And that's what it looks like. How many zeros are back there? Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, sixteen zeros and seven, five in front of it. That's the number of grains of sand that science has said. Now, of course, it's pretty close to approximate, but they say it's pretty close to accurate. It's not exactly accurate, but it's pretty close. I, I don't know that number. When I took, uh, you know, when I graduated from math in sixth grade or whatever, we, we didn't get to the quintillions. The stars, well, this is a good one, 70 septillion stars. That's a seven followed by 23 zeros. You mean there's more stars than there's grains of sand? Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he placed the stars in the heavens, Genesis 1. And he calls them by name. And for every one grain of sand that man thinks that they can measure, there's 10,000 stars. I want that to set in. We're talking about the infinitude of God who can create all that we are talking about. Right? That's why I don't understand it. And that's why... You can't understand it. These are numbers beyond my little pea brain. But here's what we know. In John chapter 21, verse 25, we're about to wrap this up. John 20, 21, verse 25. <laughs> it's the last verse of the book of John. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. And were every one of them to be written in his 33 years on earth, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Yeah, Jesus and God and the Spirit, they're forever. We sometimes think we're somebody. It's kind of like Chuck Norris. What? Oh, yeah. You know, you hear all the stuff about Chuck Norris. Well, Chuck Norris doesn't do push-ups. He pushes the world down. You know, when Chuck jumps in water, he doesn't get wet. The water gets Chuck Norris. So we, we make fun of that, and we think, you see, what happens is we think we're somebody. We arrive to a certain point in our life, and we say, yeah, look at what I've done. What'd you do? What have you done? In light of the infinitude of God, which is where we will live eternally. People, it's time that you and I recognize that we can have a spiritual experience with God right here at your home, in your workplace, at your work table, in your bed at night, driving down the highway, just don't close your eyes in prayer. It's time we realize that God is big enough to be worshipped and praised. And we don't need to wait till kids get back from camp to hear testimonies of how God changed your life. God changed my life, not as a Christian, not as a believer. He did that years ago. But as a young adult coach, he used a 13-year-old girl to change my life. It was a spiritual experience. One day I'll tell you about it. It wasn't in church. It was at a track meet. And God hit me square in the heart, not the face, in the heart. That's when I said, God, I want to be, I want that Christ hidden in me. As much as I love you, that's not what's spewing out right now. We can have that experience. 
And that's my prayer for you. Father God, I thank you for allowing us to know who you are as Savior and Lord. And yet, God, I recognize that there is so little that we can actually understand and comprehend about your infinitude. So please, dear God, wake us up so we can live for you and have a spiritual experience every day of our life in your infinitude, knowing that you alone is what life is about. Life's not about us. Life is about you. Thank you for loving us and for sending Jesus. And if there's anyone in this room or in the voice, the, the uh, hearing of my voice, online. God, I pray that they can have an experience with you right now as well and be drawn closer and recognize that their life should be as a believer because you said it is. Their life is hidden with Christ in God. And if that's not the case, then God, give them the strength and courage like that little young lady in the Boxer Rebellion in China. Give me the strength and courage to do whatever it takes to face what's about to happen. God, that's my prayer. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ms. Kerbeth plays this song. We talked about hide and seek early. I just want you to think about this song. There's some decision you need to make. Today's the day of salvation, even for renewal. Whether it's here publicly whether it's at home in the privacy with your family, your loved one, your children, whatever it is, you make that decision. So you get to come home. Coming home to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. one time. I want to invite you just to sing it with me. It's a praise to our Lord. for your attendance here this morning. I pray God's blessings on you this week. Whatever, whatever you find yourself doing this week, whether work or play or at home or whatever it is, uh, may God impress upon you how big he is, how big he is. A little song we used to sing in children, how big is our God. Our God is so great, so strong, and so mighty. That's who God is, and he wants to be that in your life. Father God, thank you again for this time together, and I pray that you would Wrap your arms around us as we depart. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you are dismissed. Again, thank you so much for coming this morning.